Assalamu alaikum. Today we are going to start with Matthew Arnold. Matthew Arnold lived from 1822 to 1888. That was during the Victorian era. Now, considering Victorian age, you need to remember one, one, one very important thing. Of course, you must have read this in your Social History of England and History of English Literature as well. But uh, it doesn't hurt to remind you once again. See, it was the age of transformations. It was the age of transformations as in it was kind of a, not exactly the Renaissance kind of transformation where literature in, in art seemed to have taken prominence and, and there was a revival of, you know, um, the literary study. That That's not the kind of transformation we're talking about. It was not the age of enlightenment as such. It was the age wherein major transformation in terms of science, industry, technology, um, in politics were happening. Because see, um, Matthew Arnold was born in 1822, right? In 1832 came the Reform Bill. So re with this Reform Bill, the power invested in the hands of very few, that is the upper class alone, that power was transformed, I mean, or, or was passed on to the, uh, to the middle classes. So the the right to vote the so it came into being. People were starting. People had started agitating um, in various cases. Like for instance, um, they were asking for equal rights. Women were asking asking for equal rights. Uh, the working class they were they were protesting against the inhumane conditions of the the industries they were working in. You know, the, the so. People started talking and of course free education, free educa education was made free for everyone. So in that case, not only the aristocracy, but everyone was educated. So every single child was educated to some degree. I'm not talking about the, you know, um, education for all system. No, that was not the case. As you would have seen in uh, uh, many of Charles Dickens writings, it uh, no, the, the writing of, um, I, I believe, Oliver Twist, David Copperfield, Great Expectations, it would all tell you the story of what Victorian age was like. Right? So, see, during that age, people were getting educated. And there were people, there was another set of class, a certain, another section of people who were growing in demand, as in the, the working class. So there was a movement from village to cities. So uh, the old, they were leaving off their fields, they were leaving their, their country homes, country homes as in like the, their own villages, and they were moving to the industrial sites where they were, uh, uh, look at, for instance, consider um, Jyoti Obscure from, from uh, Thomas Hardy's, Thomas Hardy's uh, Jyoti Obscure, how, uh, you know, the story of Jude, how he moves from this very innocent village life and moves on to the city and how he seems to have been, you know, gradually he's, he feels corrupted over time and, and uh, the, the, the indignities he faces, the misfortunes he, he counters. Yeah, so, so, so this was the age that tried and tested the best of men. I'm not talking about best of, in the best of men, I'm not talking about the people with a lot of money. I'm talking about the people that grew, the, who grew with a certain innocence in their life, a certain, you know, a certain purity of purpose in their life. That was corrupted to a, to a great deal. And again, uh, even, in, even in terms, there was a transformation, major transformation, not merely transformation, major transformations where religion was concerned. See, with the um, Charles Darwin, I believe you are familiar with Charles Darwin and his origin of species, the evolution of species and all those, um, the theory, I believe. So, see, the, during this time, during this period, the very faith of people was sh shaken because of this uh, particular theory. Because, see, all along... You had this biblical idea of the world being created, having been created in uh, in seven days, and how God created man and Adam and Eve, and He put them in the earth, and for 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 the original sin they committed. That was the original idea, but according to Darwin, but but Darwin's theory it negated it completely, it brought in question everything that was famously believed so if you don't believe 
that God created man and I mean uh, so according to evolutionary species species man evolved from apes right that's the idea Darwin put forth so he had all these hypothetical evidence according to him I mean that hypothetical evidence itself is a paradox uh, in itself but he provided certain theories that indicated that um, man evolved from apes so if you stop believing that god created man you obviously have no uh, you obviously won't have any sense of heaven or hell you won't have any uh, you know contention upon uh, how to behave in this life how to live your life you won't have any fear of repercussions you have you won't, if you don't have any fear of you know the day of judgment obviously you won't have any moral compass on which with which you would work right the moral compass as in what to do what not to do what is right what is wrong you go good and evil you, you won't you won't think twice about committing a crime because mainly because you don't you no longer believe in god so if you don't believe in god anymore how are we to live anymore because that's what prevents us from doing good, right? We all have this both good and bad within us, right? All of us. Like, no one can say that I am completely devoid of any evil thought at all. No one, neither you nor I. We all have some sense, some sense of value, some sense of moral, mainly because we fear God to some degree. We fear that if we do something wrong, karma is going to bite us, right? Karma is going to hit us back. So if before I before I start being you know cruel to someone, I start I, I, I think twice about doing it, mainly because I know that ultimately I have to pay for it. I know that ultimately I am answerable to God. That's the idea, that's that's the very you know, and that's the very very basis of our all our um, you know morals and, and principles and values. So if that is lost how are we to find our way in this life so that's the question that that you know that bogged most of the philosophers during that time because see the church the people believed implicitly in church whatever the church said they followed so the religion was the main stronghold it had been a main stronghold for centuries now and all of a sudden that faith has been shaken that faith has been removed and now what people are doing is that they don't have any guide they don't have any moral compass that could guide them through their lives so ultimately there is a rise in crime there there are people who don't have any purpose in the life because see all purpose is lost if you succeed well and good if you don't succeed what happens you tend to lose your faith and and, and during those times of depression, what holds you strong? What makes you strong? What makes you get up and start again? God, the faith in God. So if you are faithless, if you don't have any faith, you don't have any purpose anymore. So here, Matthew Arnold, he argued, he argued very insistently that yes, literature can take the place of religion in these times mainly because religion has lost its stronghold and people no longer the majority of people have started questioning religion again of course it was reversed because of uh, uh, because of the see there is always epochs epochs as in e p o c h s epochs as in how uh, how there is there comes a certain age where there, where there is disbelief and uh, because of that age uh, another age is created where there is too much radical belief and again to counter it there is a, a there there comes another age where there is a tempering of the radical belief that fanaticism is tempered down to some degree and again there comes an age so see th there are epochs always created you know um, as a chain reaction you know one causes the other the cause and effect seems to can continue onwards okay so of course with uh, people like uh, kebble and uh, um and and there were other and newman and all those other you know individuals who worked hard to restore the faith people had already lost from the church okay so 
the, so this this was an age of contrast contrast as in there was plenty in terms of the boom in industrial revolution and also there was want want as in there were people who were starving they were working for for nearly 18 to 20 hours a day but still not making enough living right enough of enough money to send back home and and, and the conditions of the the industries were abominable there were there, the children were employed in those glass houses all you have to do is you just need to read charles dickens novels to see them i mean like yes of course uh, you have very very fine example here itself not fine but a very unhappy example here as in sivkasi where even children are employed right so you see there uh, it was an age of contrast where people had money some people had a lot of money they were gain, gaining you know making a lot of money and at the same time there was another class who had let you know who had left their homes who had left the villages you know their thriving um, or flourishing fields of agriculture agricultural fields they left those and come to city only to face drudgery and work and with no proper recompense or with proper compensation right so um so matthew arnold's writing is shaped by these circumstances you need to remember that because see he could not wax poetic like wordsworth or coleridge or keats or shelley or byron because see those those people were not accustomed to or they were not familiar with these circumstances that age was an entirely different age wherein they were mainly concerned with how imagination worked or how um, you know their their biggest concern was poetic diction right they had entire day and night to argue about what kind of words to choose for poetry what kind of situations to choose for poetry but matthew anold came when when matthew and all came into the picture it was an age of agitation it was an age where people were fighting for their rights fighting for their living fighting for better conditions to live for right you have to keep all of these these in mind when you read matthew and all okay so see again he uh, there is a famous see I, I am saying this mainly because uh, i haven't included it in uh, the slides uh, because it was not in your book but you have to also remember certain things about Arnold. He also created this idea of epochs, okay, uh, in, in which, I mean, I told you about epochs as in how um, there is faith and there is, um, you know, lack of loss of faith and then a radical faith in terms of religion. Now, Arnold also speaks of critics, critics and criticism and creativity. So he believes that criticism gives way to creativity so um, in every age there are critics who channel the creativity of the create you know of the writers of that age so he believes that you know creativity of a certain age you know a creative output of a certain age depends upon the critics of the time so that's how he came to write about the functions of criticism at the present time okay uh, that was one of his most popular essays that deals with what a critic ought to do. What is the function of criticism? Okay, so to him, it was a, a criticism is something that guides people, the guides guides the writer to write well. Okay, tells the writer what to write. So it it shows the way as to how to you know write poetry or novel or whatever it is and what subjects to choose so it is in the hands of the critics so see oh, all this while the creator that is the writer was given prominence but now all of a sudden the critic seems to be the one who is leading the writer by the hand you get my point the the, uh, the critic seems to the one who guides the writer how to write, what to write, what subject to choose, what language to use. You get my point? So, um, I'll move on from here. So, so, I believe you have a basic understanding of the Victorian age to some extent. We'll do, we will discuss about the Victorian age constantly throughout, uh, um, throughout this uh, period, um, through the next week possibly, because um, this may take some time. Okay. So first of all, Arnold Carlyle Ruskin were the prominent voices of the conscience of the age. 
you have to remember ruskin here would not be ruskin born please bear that in mind we are talking about john ruskin here the john john ruskin the famous architect uh, architect and uh, writer okay so he was also an art critic okay so these were the so if you read ruskin's sesame and the lees you would find how he um, you know focuses upon what kind of books to read okay what kind of books men should read what kinds of books women should read he divides uh, you know he okay it may be a kind of an obsolete notion as to wherein uh, women should be um, you know women should be made to read certain kind of books and and should avoid certain kind of education but it does give you a, a, a an indication of what um you know indication of uh, what kind of writing that was prevalent during his time of course many people oppose ruskin's uh, ideas today um, uh, mainly because of uh, they, they consider it kind of um misogynistic right <laughs> i couldn't think of a better word yeah he, he is considered misogynist to some extent but you oh yeah actually they they are worth reading please do read his amazing lilies if you can okay all right so oh yes so they were the main voices of conscience of the age of that particular age now consider um, so considering this the victorian era um Victorian era during the Victorian era morality religion and arts were given a fresh boost because they were in great danger of becoming extinct okay so morality was you know being torn to shreds religion was being questioned the very faith was being shaken and arts again was deteriorating so if you don't have any moral compass with which to stand or with which to work you won't really consider the Uh, the you know, the implications of what what kind of effect what effect your art would have on the reading public so reading or uh, you know the the um the ones who are interested in arts right so this was uh, so these people sort of guided okay so so see arts would i'm been with speaking in general terms here mainly because see it was not restricted to writing alone okay arts was not restricted to writing alone as you well know we are talking about arts here mainly because ruskin was mainly concerned also concerned with the architecture okay so he refused to include uh, you know grotesque figures which were a part of the gothic uh, you know gothic architecture he 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 focused upon the uh, the the fine lines the nuances that created good good uh, you know good architecture or oh, art now marcy arnold was the son of thomas arnold headmaster of rugby school now thomas arnold, thomas arnold was pretty famous uh, himself because he was not merely the headmaster he was also a oh, you know uh, he was also a discerning um you know a, a discerning um, individual in this in his field okay in his field in the sense he uh, he was also consider uh, sorry concerned with the social literary scene of the time okay therefore he, it is no surprise it comes as no surprise that matthew arnold was also considered as a de facto social literary critic of the time okay so there is a great deal of influence you know from his father uh, on arnold on how he how he viewed the uh, you know the the literary culture or the social uh, structure or, or the changing social structure of of his time obviously he became a very fine voice a very outspoken voice outspoken critic of his time so arnold was made the professor of poetry at oxford at the age of 35 okay he was pretty young when he held that position i mean when he became a professor it, it, it was not something that that could uh, that anyone or any anyone could uh, easily um, become okay he was accorded this honor he was uh, he became a professor at the at a very young age and delivered several lectures and wrote pamphlets as a critic and reformer so you see 
the university education was being popularized and there were so many writers who were writing for the general reading public there were plenty of uh, you know um, because of the education that was you know, made free for everyone there was a great demand for reading material and of course that was supplied to them by the writers in the uh, you know at oxford at oxford and cambridge of course so he too wrote several lectures he too deli delivered several lectures and So, uh, just a brief note on Victorian criticism. During Queen Victoria's reign, England prospered, of course, mainly due to colonialism. So, during Victor Queen Victoria's time, more than, you know, uh, the, more than three fourths of her colonies were built or, or grew during Victoria's time, Queen Victoria's time. The policies were strenuous, and the people were living off from the colonial. Um, you know <clears throat> profits profits gained uh, by ill means as far as uh, from our perspective but for them it was a way it was just business for them right so uh, so there are two sides to a coin so the england was prospering due to colonialism science and industry flourished of course as i've already spoken industry because of uh, james ward steam engine all sorts of uh, the, you know the huge interest industries were set up there were some people who, who were with conscience and who saw to it that there were very few, very few of those people who were concerned about how the workers lived, the conditions of the workers or the timings of the, uh, uh, you know, the hours they worked, the, the money that, you know, they were not that money minded. They were more mainly concerned with progress, progress for all. But the, largely there was a majority of industrialists who were mainly f focused on filling their own pockets. Okay, so uh, obviously industry flourished mainly uh, to, to to a large degree to the talent of the people, but to uh, but also to a degree of greed among you know uh, among those uh, very same men. The science and industry flourished. Charles Darwin's Origin of Species, eighteen fifty nine, put forth the theory of human evolution that questioned traditional religious orthodoxy. Traditional religious orthodoxy would indicate orthodoxy, you know, the faith, the strict faith in God, right? The traditional religious orthodoxy would indicate the faith that that has been, you know, long standing, that is that has been carried on for ages, for centuries, right? That uh, that that kind of religious orthodoxy is called into question. Because of this theory of human evolution, theory of human evolution as proposed by Charles Darwin in his Origin of Species. Because according to this theory, man was not created by God, but evolved through uh, degrees of uh, uh, species. And finally, we, man came into being from ape, through some transformations, through evolutionary transformations from ape. So... And science itself called religion into question. The Oxford movement, on the other hand, with privileges and sacraments attributed to church, attracted individuals like Cardinal Newman, Kevel Freud. Right? So, Newman and Kevel are very famous figures, or I believe I've already spoken about it. Famous figures who, who, who did a great deal of... Um, religious and reformative work okay or um we'll talk about it further in the next class uh, but for now i'll just finish with this democracy took center stage and universities flourished of course there were people as i said earlier the reform uh, the reform act of 1833 uh, invested the middle class people with some power some say some voice in the working of the government so obviously a large number of people they started voicing out their own concerns and everyone now uh, uh, took to uh, uh, talking about policies and governmental policies and how it affected them and all that so democracy took center stage and universities flourished of course with the with the you know uh, free uh, education being made free there were people who were you know getting educated and well educated and they understood the importance of getting education all right which was not the case during the Romantic Age or, or, the, or its preceding ages. 
with free education reading public increased which brought about changes in modes and practice of people and values of life of course with free education a large number of people started reading and with it came the demand for more reading material and with the demand came you know uh, uh, writers writers of all sorts writers who wrote well and writers who wrote for ill as well and with it came the change in modes and practices of people and values of life so there were people who were who um who claimed that there was no god no religion nothing but man alone and man himself is capable of of holding himself supreme and all that and there were people who uh, who wrote very poorly without really you know considering the ill consequences of of their writing and uh, there were people who were mainly focused on reforming or, and and guiding and, and bringing moral principles morals and principles back to people's lives okay so there was all kinds of writings available during that time england prospered industrially of course i've already spoken about it but it does require stressing again you know this point bear stressing again and again mainly because it had such wide implications but morally aristocrats were barbarians middle class philistines and common people populists beyond provincial and uncivilized lacking in culture so even though they were they were you know prospering industrially as in a set of people a group of people were prospering industrially morally most of them the and the aristocrats were still barbarians mainly because they were corrupted morally and milk look the see the you you should see the practices of the time because they were mainly concerned with just merely idling away the time the aristocrats they were not it was considered ill you know ill breeding or uncivilized for the aristocrats to gain a proper employment all right the aristocrats were expected to have an idle life idle life as in not do any work at all so see they were barbarian so if you don't have any purpose in life if you don't have any work in life what would you do see the majority of people who are corrupt are the ones who are idle please bear this in mind okay if you're idle you tend to be a barbarian <laughs> not barbarian I, I mean it would be um, demeaning to call uh, these people barbarians i mean uh, the demeaning to insulting to the barbarians uh, to you know uh, use them as an analogy for for these people but yes aristocrats were barbarians in that sense okay they were not behaving like animals but yes they were uh, because of their idleness they were considered barbarians middle class were philistines why philistines because they were losing the faith they were becoming more and more money minded they were becoming mercenary largely and they had uh, you know with uh, uh, they did not really um you know follow any morals to get the money they wanted okay so it by hook or crook they wanted to make money so th this was something that was uh, uh that was popularly known at that time it was it had become a kind of an adage at that time and com common populace beyond provincial and uncivilized lacking in culture the common people the people in majority the common man was beyond provincial provincial as in that's something that is very restricted in experience that is very uh, you know na narrow minded oh. right provincial and uncivilized they were not civilized to the to the degree that they were expected to 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 have a, a refined or more civilized life and hence they were lacking in culture uh, we'll discuss this at length in the next class for now this is all Thank you so much for your patient listening. Stay safe. Assalamu alaikum.